Yes, we are invited this day to hasten to God's throne. That space where we know that we are truly loved, truly supported, truly one of God's children. Would you pray with me? Holy God, you are calling to us now. Help us to hear and to heed your call and to heed your command to come away and to rest in your presence. So here we are, opening up ourselves to encounter your word among us. In our seeking and in our resting, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be a delight to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. It's in the matchless name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved, this sermon is about time. And I want to admit right up front that this sermon comes at the right time for me personally. Yes, it's about time. Because this sermon is about the spiritual practice of keeping Sabbath, God's time. And it is certainly a bit odd to be standing here before you to preach about a spiritual practice like this that I yet yet to perfect. (laughs) As pastors, we make it a point to have one day a week that is dedicated to Sabbath keeping. That's supposed to be Friday for me. (laughs) And I'll confess that as of late, my Sabbath days have become abbreviated for the sake of work and for wedding planning. Very important things. And you may expect a pastor to preach only about that which they have perfected. But this is antithetical to our faith that is grounded in God's growth of grace. I'm reminded of a journal entry by one of the founders of the Methodist movement, John Wesley. He was recounting a conversation with his friend and mentor, the Moravian Peter Bowler. Wesley asked him, how can I preach to others when I have not faith myself? To which Bowler replied, Preach faith until you have it. And then, because you have it, you will preach faith. So today I find myself in an eerily similar position. So today I will preach Sabbath until I have it. Let us preach Sabbath until we have it this day. Well, perhaps the best way to begin a sermon about Sabbath is to give myself a break. Because Sabbath is about giving ourselves a break. And because spiritual practices are just that, they're practices. They're not things that are perfected or accomplished. It's not like I can check them off a to-do list as a way of marking my journey towards perfection. In fact, perfectionism, perfection as we understand it, is always tied up with perfectionism. And perfectionism is an anxious way to live that's less about grace and more about guilt and shame. It's less about the abundance of God and more about efficiently managing scarcity. So let us not get distracted where perfect would stand in the way of the good. Instead, let us approach Sabbath with the faith that God is always calling us into that deeper relationship, an eternal call greeting us here in the present moment, right here, right now. And so this sermon is about time. And you know it's hard to talk about time. It's hard to talk about time because time makes us anxious, doesn't it? There are looming deadlines. We fear it may be too late for us to achieve our potential. And we worry that there's just never enough time. And perhaps what makes us most anxious is that we have no control over time. It continues to march forward with a steady beat with or without us. And you know, it's, it's particularly hard to talk about time in the English language because time is literally talked about like money. Time is something saved and something spent. Time is given and time is taken away. And of course, maybe the worst of our linguistic excesses here, time can be wasted. What an agonizing image. You can just feel the time anxiety washing over you to think that you can waste your time, that you can throw away this time without value or like an obstacle to living a good life. It's almost as if our language was shaped by Pharaoh himself, 
to make sure that we never escape this worldview that our time on earth is not our own, but instead we are just cogs in a wheel to keep producing forever and ever for a false god called mammon. In a hyper-commodified world, organized in service of the almighty market, time can and does have a dollar value that can be bartered and sold. Well, with inflation, more and more time feels like it's being devoted to work just to make ends meet. In the peculiar American mixture of hustle culture and Puritan perfectionism, with this, there's this entire industry devoted to productivity and optimizing our time to make the best use of every second. Theoretically, this would be to help us get work done more quickly, right? But we all know. <laughs> but we all know that this just means that we're going to work harder for the same number of hours. Yes, it's always about time. So where can we turn to find our grounding in the midst of the grind? And where can we find reprieve from a world hell-bent on taking our time away from us? Well, we can turn to the ancient spiritual practice of Sabbath, a practice that is fundamentally rooted in God's creation and liberation of us all. In a world where time is money, it is always timely to talk about Sabbath. Because it is certainly a challenge to get, given all of the forces that push up against it, and it can feel impossible simply to condemn, commend the practice of Sabbath to us all. But nevertheless, the Sabbath is a core part of our religious heritage. The Sabbath is where we can turn our attention this week for our Lenten journey. You see, it starts in the book of Exodus. Well, it really starts in the book of Genesis. After the six days of creation, God consecrates the seventh day after six days of work and says, this day is the Sabbath. Keep it and make it holy. And this is reiterated in Exodus, part of the Ten Commandments. In fact, it's the fourth commandment. God reminds Israel, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, nor your community, and not even your animals. Traditionally, the Sabbath, which literally means rest, is the seventh day of the week where work of any kind is prohibited. And in some of the most conservative interpretations of this ritual, practitioners are not allowed to conduct business on the Sabbath, not allowed to make food, not allowed to travel, and some not even allowed to use electricity. But what's important to see is that Sabbath is about pressing pause on our everyday lives in a world that seeks to take all of our lives. Sabbath is about pressing pause so that we can dedicate one day to the Lord our God. The great 20th century rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel talks about Sabbath as the center of our allegiance to God. To observe the Sabbath day is to say that God is Lord and that mammon is not. And it is more than just countercultural. Sabbath is a practice that in in intentionally contradicts the commodifying powers of this world. At its core, Sabbath is a revolutionary act that contradicts any claims this world may have on us to say that we should be ashamed of who we are. Instead, we can rest on the Sabbath and what God tells us from the very beginning. You are very good. Now, the Bible doesn't necessarily give many instructions or detailed instructions on how we practice the Sabbath. There is simply the commandment to keep the seventh day holy and not to work. And this perceived ambiguity has led to centuries of hopefully generative conversation about what makes a good Sabbath and how to keep it holy. And still, as any interpretation has to be made, it continually must be judged by time and the Spirit of God to see if it is still true and relevant for us today. And so in our scripture today, we see Jesus offering his own judgment of the Pharisees' interpretation of how to, how to practice Sabbath. Now before we get to the drama of this scene, it's important to understand, uh, understand a few things. In rabbinical Judaism, scripture is God-breathed and meant to be followed. Yet with 613 commandments in the Torah, the question of how is always up for debate, especially when some of these commandments are in conflict with one another. 
So to make determinations on these interpretations, this is the practice of Midrash. And it may be best understood through the image of wrestling with God and with one another through the text. So in order to make some of these interpretive decisions, there are different schools of thought as to what is the particular hermeneutic to follow. Now, hermeneutic is a fancy word that just is our key for how we make interpretations of Scripture. And these schools of thought would call this hermeneutic the greatest commandment. And so for the Pharisees, the greatest commandment is the fourth commandment, to observe the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. So for the Pharisees, all of life is organized around keeping the Sabbath holy, which meant discerning any rules and setting up any rules that are to prohibit work on the Sabbath. Now, the Pharisees don't get a sympathetic view in the Gospels, but I think it's always important at this juncture to make a few points. First, the Pharisees, the the concern for the Pharisees is about holiness and purity of the Sabbath, and not simply the observance of it. Jesus himself practiced the Sabbath, as did all uh, temple-worshipping Jews in in Roman Palestine. But where the Pharisees start to become pharisaical is in their fervor to set black and white rules that come with severe consequences and that leave little room for grace. Second, the Pharisees' commitment to Sabbath purity for many comes from a genuine concern for the well-being of the ancient Jewish people. In generations past, the prophets of Israel had proclaimed that their displacement and devastation would come at the cause of profaning the Sabbath. And so when the Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, this traumatic event was explained through a failure of Sabbath observance. So when the ancient Jewish people returned to Judea under another empire, the belief was simple. We must keep the Sabbath holy so that we may remain in our sacred land. But if we ever profane the Sabbath, God will evict us from the land. A very harsh theology indeed. And one that responds, however imperfectly, to the anxiety that was passed down through generational trauma. But Jesus comes to expose the ways that sin corrupts even our most sincere intentions and to liberate us from oppressions both inside and out. And Jesus' guiding principle was his own greatest commandment, and perhaps you've heard of it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All interpretations must be made through this standard. So now an internal rabbinical debate comes into a dramatic head in our scripture today. Jesus makes it clear that according to his love hermeneutic, some of the Pharisees' prohibitions actually prevent us from loving our neighbors as ourselves. For Jesus, the practice of Sabbath is always in service of that higher goal, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And in this case, it's to feed the hungry and to heal the sick. But unfortunately, as we see, the Pharisees cannot see past their own trauma beyond their own internalized oppression and desire for revenge. And like Pharaoh in the Exodus story, their hearts are hardened within them, and they cannot believe that God could be at work doing something wondrous and new today. And so the plotting begins to persecute, to silence, and eventually try to vanquish Jesus, the troublesome itinerant preacher. And yet, Jesus was just getting started. And his liberation gospel was spreading throughout the world and would continue to spread in spite of persecution. Now, what does this story have to teach us about practicing Sabbath? There are no clear technical instructions on how to practice the Sabbath here. But instead, this story illumines to us how we are to approach the Sabbath. Jesus says the Sabbath was made for people and not people for the Sabbath. So Sabbath, when properly practiced, is meant to affirm life and connect us to God and to one another. It is about prioritizing the God of love and not a God of vengeance. Moreover, Sabbath is not about following a simple rule not to work. It is a summons to a deeper rest, a rest that is rooted in the spirit of God that inspires us each and every day. (laughs) 
Indeed, Sabbath rest is like weeding the garden of life to create space for the new thing that God is doing among us. When we take a day to cease from our work and to rest in God, we leave the anxious worldly time and we embrace God's time. Eternal time. Eternal life. So we are invited this week, beloved, to practice Sabbath. A Sabbath that is spirit-led. So I wonder what do we need to say no to this week in order to embrace God's time for a full day? Or at least part of a day? And what does real rest look like for you? Because I know for me it doesn't look like binge-watching TV or doom scrolling, or gossiping. Well, Sabbath means different things for different people. And for some people, it will mean spending an entire 24 period during the week to completely put away work and to have a day to be free and do those things that restore us and restore our bodies and spirits. Now, of course, for others, it may not be so simple to set aside a full 24 hours. So maybe we break up our routine once a week or a little bit every day to practice our God-given freedom and resist a culture of busyness and restlessness. You know, here are some practical options as you're considering what you might do. You could spend one way of your commute. I bring up the commute a lot because that's what I do. Uh, I'm always on my phone during my commute. Uh, You might spend part of your commute not scrolling on social media and instead observing what's going on around you how God might, in fact, be moving right there. You could turn off the TV during your meal this week and enjoy a conversation with your family, with a friend, or even with God. You can take a 30-minute walk outside, uh, move your body and breathe new air. And of course, we can just take a moment every day to give God thanks for all of our blessings. In the end, Sabbath is about setting aside time. That is so hard to do sometimes. But we are invited to set aside time, to consecrate time to rest, to rest in God's love. We are invited to let work be incomplete for just a day, because work will always be incomplete, and to rest in the spirit of freedom and healing. Yes, we can rest in God's time, in the God who says that we are enough and we are beloved right here, right now. God is calling you to divine rest. God is is inviting you to Sabbath keeping. Let it be so. Amen. So as we've done...